The Weather Bureau says it's the hottest, driest year on record. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to our latest post covering finance and property news with a distinctively Australian flavour. The Conversation published today the latest report from the Bureau of Meteorology. And I wanted to share it with you and then use this as a jumping off point to have a slightly broader discussion about the relationship between all the elements that are leading to the polarised debate about climate change on one hand and about bush burning on the other. Because frankly, the current debate, I think, is pretty poor in Australia. And we seem to have politicised this issue, which is way more important than that. Anyway, let's start by looking at what the BOM said. The BOM annual climate statement just released confirms that 2019 was the nation's warmest and driest year on record. It's the first time since overlapping records began that Australia experienced both its lowest rainfall and highest temperatures in the same year. The national rainfall total was 37 millimetres or 11.7% below the 314.5 millimetre recorded in the previous driest year back in 1902. The national average temperature was nearly 0.2% above the previous warmest year back in 2013. Globally, 2019, they say, is likely to be the second warmest year, with global temperatures about 0.8 degrees Celsius above the 1961 to 1990 average. It has been the warmest year without the influence of El Nino. Across the year, Australia experienced many extreme events, including flooding in Queensland and large hail in New South Wales. However, due to prolonged heat and drought, the year began and ended with fires burning across the Australian landscape. Bushfire activity for the 2018-19 season began in late November 2018 when fires burned along a 600-kilometre stretch of the central Queensland coast. Widespread fires later followed across Victoria and Tasmania throughout the summer. Persistent drought and record temperatures were a major driver of the fire activity, they said, and the context for 2019 lies in the past three years of drought. The dry conditions steadily worsened over 2019, resulting in Australia's driest year on record, with average area rainfall of just 277.6 millimetres, whereas the 1961 to 1990 average is 465.2 millimetres. Almost the entire continent experienced rainfall in the lowest 10th percentile over the year. Record low rainfall affected the central and southern inland regions of the continent and the northeastern Murray-Darling Basin straddling the New South Wales and Queensland border. Many weather stations over central parts of Australia received less than 30 millimetres of rainfall for the year. Every capital city recorded below average annual rainfall. And for the first time, national rainfall was below average in every month. 2019 was Australia's warmest year on record, with the annual mean temperature 1.52 degrees Celsius above the 1961 to 1990 average, surpassing the previous record of 1.33 degrees Celsius above average in 2013. January, February, March... April, July, October, November and December were all amongst the 10 warmest on record for Australian mean temperatures for their respective months, with January and December exceeding their previous records by 0.98 degrees Celsius and 1.08 degrees Celsius respectively. Maximum temperatures recorded an even larger departure from average with 2.09 degrees Celsius for the year. This is the first time the nation has seen an anomaly of more than 2 degrees Celsius and about half a degree warmer than the previous record back in 2013. 
The year brought the nation's six hottest days on record, peaking at 41.9 degrees Celsius on December the 18th, the hottest week at 40.5 degrees Celsius the week ending December the 24th, the hottest month at 38.6 degrees Celsius December 2019, and the hottest season at 36.9 degrees Celsius the summer of 2018-19. The highest temperature for the year was 49.9 degrees Celsius at Nalabor, a new national December record, on December the 19th, and the coldest temperature was minus 12 degrees centigrade at Perisher Valley on the 20th of June. Keith West in southeast South Australia recorded a maximum 49.2 degrees Celsius on December the 20th, while Dover in far southern Tasmania, saw 40.1 degrees Celsius on March the 2nd, the furthest south such high temperatures have been observed in Australia. The combination of prolonged record heat and drought led to record fire weather over large areas throughout the year, with destructive bushfires affecting all states and multiple states at once in the final week of the year. Many files were difficult to contain in regions where drought has been severe, such as northern New South Wales and southeast Queensland, or where below average rainfall has been persistent, such as southeast Australia. The Forest Fire Danger Index, a measure of the fire weather severity, accumulated over the month of December, was the highest on record for that month, and the highest for any month when averaged over the whole of Australia. Record high daily index values for December were recorded at the very end of December around Adelaide and the York Peninsula in South Australia, East Gippsland in Victoria and the Monaro in New South Wales. These regions which experienced significant fire activity amidst the dry 2019 also include significant flooding across Queensland and the eastern top end. And heavy rain fell from January to early February with damaging floods around Townsville and parts of the Western Peninsula and Gulf Country. Tropical cyclone Trevor brought further heavy rain in April in the Eastern Northern Territory and Queensland and floodwaters eventually reached Lake Eyre which amidst several local rainfall deficiencies in South Australia experienced its most significant filling since 2010-11. There was a notable absence of rainfall on Australia's snowfields during winter and spring which meant less snow melt. Snow cover was generous, particularly at higher elevations. The climate each year reflects random variations in weather, slowly evolving natural climate drivers such as El Nino and long-term trends through the influence of climate change. A strong and long-lived positive Indian Ocean Dipole Another natural climate driver affected Australia from May until the end of the year and played a major role in suppressing rainfall and raising temperatures for much of the year. Spring brought an unusual breakdown of the southern polar vortex, which allowed westerly winds to affect mainland Australia. This reduced rainfall, raising temperatures and contributing to the increased fire risk. Climate change continues to cause long-term changes to Australia's climate. Conditions in 2019 were consistent with trends of declining rainfall in parts of the south, worsening fire seasons and raising temperatures. Now, when I made a post about this on the DFA blog this morning, I got a number of people with very negative feedback, claiming that the BOM numbers were made up, that in fact everything was cooling, and there was nothing to see here. Well, I have to say, I find the BOM data pretty compelling. And to my mind, it shows that we have a whole bunch of different things going on, short term, medium term, long term. Clearly, climate change is part of the story, as is the more short term weather patterns. But to simply rubbish all of this as somehow not being true seems to me, well, frankly, very naive. I think it is important to look at the data and understand it. And I also noted that quite recently there was a suggestion that BOM had been back adjusting some of their old data to make the more recent temperatures appear even hotter relative to the older data. Well, I don't know about that. 
but even the recent trends seems to highlight that we are moving into a hotter, drier environment. And that means that we need to think differently about how we mitigate the risks and prepare for a hotter future. And by the way, my own perspective is simply that climate change is real. It's part of the range of issues that are going on. I think there are questions also to be asked about bush control. And I am concerned that we see comments polarised between those who do not believe climate change has any impact at all, and in fact the world is cooling, and that all of the issues we're seeing in Australia are related to poor bush management practices on one hand, and at the other end we have people who claim that it's all to do with climate change and that we must stop exporting coal immediately and migrating to a whole new way of doing things. I don't think those two are actually mutually exclusive. It seems to me that yes, there are definitely short-term changes in the climate and some of those are to do with more local effects, but we also have the global issues to do with climate change too. But I also think there are questions about the management and effective control of fuel in the landscape and how we manage it through. So I'm looking for, again, the sensible centre. Because rather than polarising between climate change deniers versus climate change supporters on one hand and polarising for or against bush burning on the other, I think we need a more mature debate. And that mature debate needs to bring all of the available data from all sources on the table and needs to take account of all the different complexities that are driving the outcomes that we're seeing. One thing is for sure, the way we're currently doing things is not going to work into the future. And therefore, I think a Royal Commission is absolutely required to get to the bottom of some of these issues to help select and prioritise the right course of actions for the future. Because my concern is that we're going to continue to see more bushfires, more high temperatures, more droughts ahead and that means we have to take mitigation steps and also take on our fair share of tackling global warming as well. Now to illustrate the political dimension I was talking about there was an excellent article today from Mark Hudson who's a researcher on social material transformations and social movements at Keele University. And in his article, he laid out five recurring themes in Australian politics when it comes to climate change and bushfires. The first theme is blaming greenies. And he said, as the fire season ramped up in November last year, New South Wales Nationals leader John Balliario accused the Greens of preventing governments from conducting hazard reduction burning, implying the party should shoulder blame for the fires. We've got to do better, and I know that we don't do enough hazard reduction because of the ideological position from the Greens, he said. And such sentiment, which has been thoroughly debunked, regularly surfaces when bushfires rage. Following the 2003 Canberra fires and the 2009 Victorian fires, the forest industry said conservationists were preventing state governments from conducting hazard reduction burns. After Victoria's fires, former West Australian MP Wilson Tuckey also blamed the Greens and parties seeking their preferences for preventing controlled burn and causing the crisis. The second is stoking a city versus country divide. He said in November last year, Nationals leader Michael McCormack sneered that those who made the link between climate change and bushfires were, quote, raving inner city lunatics and, quote, woke capital city greenies. McCormack continues a long tradition of those opposed to strong climate change action claiming only inner city dwellers care about the issue. It began in the late 1980s when the greenhouse effect first became a public issue. Some politicians derided it as just another greenies scare campaign, including frontbencher in the Hawke Labour government, Peter Walsh. Walsh 
contemptuous of the Greens movement, continues to rail against climate action after leaving politics. He reportedly described the science around global warming as highly speculative and as late as 2008 claimed action on climate would land us in the Middle Ages. Third, experts ignored by politicians. Since April last year, former fire chiefs have implored the Morrison government to act on climate change and better prepare the nation for extreme fire seasons ahead. The government would not meet the experts to hear the advice, let alone implement it. Successive governments have form when it comes to ignoring experts on climate matters. In September 1994, the CSIRO's then top climate scientist, Graham Perlman, briefed the Labour government's cabinet about the likely impacts of climate change as a debate over whether to institute a carbon tax heat up. Despite the warning, no tax was implemented. Perlman retired a decade later under the coalition government reportedly having been asked by his superiors to resign for expressing views on climate change at odds with government policy. Fourth, leaders not fronting up. Morrison's decision to take a family holiday in Hawaii as the bushfire crisis grew lost him serious political skin. Some argue rightly that symbolism is less important than substance and so Morrison's trip is in itself irrelevant. But symbolism creates or destroys both morale and the possibility of stronger political action. In 1992, newly minted Labour Prime Minister Paul Keating sent Environment Minister Ross Kelly to the Rio Earth Summit, prompting one journalist to observe that he was preoccupied with winning the upcoming election and said he wasn't going all the way to Rio to give a six-minute speech. It made Australia the only OECD nation not represented by its head of state and sent the message that Australia was not taking a serious approach to the discussions. And fifth, the jobs, jobs, jobs mantra. He said the BOM this week confirmed this season's horror bushfire crisis is linked to climate change. Planetary warming is clearly a threat to the nation's economic well-being. However, Australian governments have routinely created a false dichotomy between environmental protection and jobs. Most recently, we've seen it in the coalition government's support for the Aldani coal mine in central Queensland and its repeated mantra of jobs, jobs, jobs. The strategy has been used before. After the Franklin Dam fight in 1983, concern over environmental issues entered the political mainstream, but as former Labour Science Minister Barry Jones said later, that changed in 1991 when economic recession hit. Jobs, jobs, jobs became the priority, and in some quarters there was a cynical reaction suggesting that environmental issues were luxuries which characterised affluent times. This is a criminally short-sighted view, he said. So, what should we do? Well, only sustained citizen pressure will prevent a repeat of the past 30 years of political failure on climate change. The public must stay informed and demand better from our elected representatives. Politicians can, when pressed, make better decisions. In April last year, for example, the New Zealand government banned offshore oil and gas exploration after years of public pressure. And the following month, the UK Parliament declared a climate emergency after months of protests by activist group Extinction Rebellion. It's often said that those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. But the world must act radically in the next decade to avoid catastrophic global warming. We cannot afford another 30 years of the same old mistakes. Well, whether you agree with Mark or not, those five points help to contrast what I'm saying, that we have to move away from a simple dichotomy between those who believe in climate change and want everything to change, and those who basically are resisting any talk of climate change and are finding many other reasons as to why we have the bushfire issues we have. And I want to remind you that currently the Australian economy is very narrowly grounded. 
we are very heavily reliant on our iron ore exports and our coal exports, as the latest data from the ABS, which came out yesterday, highlights. And I'll make another show on the detail of that later. But the real issue is that we need to find a path forward that allows us to rebalance the economy, focus on the next generation of investments in new things, rather than perpetuating the old models, and taking our fair share of responsibility for climate change in the process. That is going to be very tricky and politically very difficult. And yet that is precisely what we must do. So as I tweeted this morning, we have to move away from this stupid ideological battle between the two extremes, where it becomes a political dogfight and in the meantime people are asked to take almost a religious position on climate change versus bushfire mitigation, instead of realising that it's all part of a continuum and the fact that we need to move towards the sensible centre where we can chart a path to a new place and quickly. I'm sure I'm going to get lots of negative comments for this post, but nevertheless, this is a critical issue. The reason it's a critical issue is partly because I care passionately about Australia and the Australian landscape, but also it has a direct impact on the local economy and even things like property prices. So this is all very real stuff and we'll continue to discuss this in a hopefully balanced and rounded way as we go forward. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching and I'll see you again next time.